Hi everyone, this is Dr. Mike, host of the free iTunes podcast, Psychiatry Secrets Revealed with Dr. Mike, but that's not why I'm here today. This is another Saving Savvy episode, and this particular episode is geared towards people that want to take better architectural photos. It would be useful for a real, like a professional photographer who has never done architectural photography, but it's really geared towards those other folks that have to take very good pictures of exterior and interior architecture. And we're going to specifically talk about interior architecture because that's the one that has the the, the most tricks that you have to use. Um, so let's talk about that now. So my story is as follows. So about eight months ago, my good friend who's a general contractor asked me if I would start doing a lot more uh, interior and exterior shots for him. So these are things like kitchens and baths and family rooms and additions and you name it. Um, and I quickly discovered that although I've been taking pictures for a very long time, I was lacking something in my skills. I didn't know quite what to do. So I searched YouTube, found a lot of different stuff. Some of it was sort of contradictory um, and finally came up with my own little scheme using those ideas. So we're going to talk about better architectural photography and that's to contrast it with, with good and best. So good is what my friend did. He took his cell phone, he took some shots, he knew the right angles, and they looked pretty good. Um, but they looked like snapshots because it's a phone, right? It's, that's what it is. Now, best would be what you sometimes see in a, maybe an architectural digest or some fancy hotel brochure where a whole crew goes in, the photographer has people adjusting lights, lights are on light stands, um, he, he, the, all sorts of angles are taken, maybe a whole day in a single room, and, and then those, those pictures are heavily processed afterwards, maybe overexposed areas are masked out to put in uh, better exposed areas and power cords are cloned out and artificial lighting is put in and I mean it's a huge process it ends up with a beautiful product but it's not practical for most of these types of shots because where are these shots going well with my friend his shots go on his blog on his website and he uses them on an iPad as a sales tool Okay, so he needs a lot of different pictures. For if you're if you're a real estate person, you probably need them for those flyers and those those little magazines and those pictures are this big. So you can't spend a ton of time, but you've got to do a better job. So what do you need? What equipment do you need? Well, you need an interchangeable lens camera. Now you notice this camera does not have a lens on it because you can change the lens. It's interchangeable. And it doesn't make any difference if it's a DSLR or if it's a mirrorless camera whatever works. It doesn't make any difference how many megapixels it is. It will work. Um, and it doesn't make any difference how big the sensor is. So this is a full frame sensor. This is an older camera. It's a it's a uh, Canon um, 5D Mark III. So it's a little bit older camera, but it's a great, great camera. This is a full frame sensor. Now you can't really see the sensor, but you can see the mirror in there. Um, and you can see it's quite big. It's the size of a 35 millimeter piece of film. But there are much smaller sensors called APS-C and even smaller sensors called micro four thirds. Any of those cameras would work fine as long as you have the right lens. The other thing that you need on this camera is you need a hot shoe. That's going to be important. And the camera is going to have to take exposure bracketing, which means that the camera will have to have the ability to take it the, the, the image at the correct exposure and then overexposed at least one or more and underexposed at least one or more steps below or stops. So those are the basic requirements. Now one thing that I also like is for the ability for the camera to do in-camera HDR. In other words, take those multiple exposures and combine them into a more balanced exposed picture right in the camera because I'm all about efficiency. I, I, I want to get a product that looks good, but I want it done as efficiently as possible. Now you might say, well, you don't want to do that. You want to do them in software because it might look better. Good, good for you. Go do it. But I'm just letting you know my tips and tricks. You'll also need an ultra wide angle lens because especially on interiors, you're going to want a wide expansive view and you're going to want a lens like this one. Now this is a lens that he actually lent me this because he tried to do this. This is probably a, maybe a 15 or 20 year old lens. This is a um, Canon 16 to 35 f 2.8 lens. Um, it's very fast, very very expensive lens. You don't need this uh, this expensive of a lens. You can use a less expensive lens, but it mounts on your camera like this, and now I'm all ready to go. 
The other thing that you're going to need is a flash because you're not always going to be in a situation where you'll have enough ambient light and a flash can come in handy. So it could be any kind of flash you want. This happens to be a Canon branded flash for the Canon camera. So again, it's a very old flash, works just fine. It could be a manual flash, it could be anything. Now, most cameras will have built into them a level and you're gonna want your pictures to be level. If you don't have that, your tripod might have a level on it or you could even buy a little cheap level like this that sits in your hot shoe and lets you know if the image or the camera is level or not. Very important, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But that's all you basically need are just those simple those simple things and so you can get a used camera you can get an older camera you can buy a used lens you can get a manual flash you know you can go pretty inexpensively I'm not talking about thirty dollars inexpensive but I'm talking about certainly well under a thousand dollars inexpensive and you have a kit that can produce professional level results so because you're not looking at a high like a very wide open fast lens you want to actually have everything in sharp and that means that you're gonna have your your aperture a little bit smaller like maybe 5.6 or so or even smaller than that depending on what you're shooting um, you can all lenses will do that and so you're gonna to want to get a zoom lens in the following ranges so if you are looking at an, the, the full size full sensor there you want the the max or the widest place to be like 15 16 17 millimeters so for instance there's a Canon lens 17 to 40 f4 it sells for 400 and $45 on eBay. Um, if you're going for the APS-C sensor, which is a little bit smaller, that means that your, your lens fo a focal length will be smaller too. But here's, for instance, I found a 10 to 20 f 4.5 to 5.6 lens. Again, not the fastest on the planet. For 300 bucks for that lens, it would work just fine. If you had a micro four thirds camera that has an even smaller sensor, that's going to be a, four, a 7 to 14 lens. You can get a uh, F4 Panasonic one. I found one for like $500. Um, there's less variety there because the four thirds lenses have been out for less time, but still not, not a bad price. So now you have all your equipment. So what are you going to do? Well, first things first, clean up the mess. So what we'll often do is after he cleans the kitchen, he'll hire a professional person to come in and clean that area so it's spotless. If there's clutter, the clutter needs to be removed. Obviously, no dishes in the sink, no socks on the floor, no toilet seats up, no bathrobes on the back of a door. I mean, just common sense stuff like that. I'll actually go in sometimes and let's say the place is clean, let's say the kitchen is clean, but they still have their tchotchke stuff out. I'll actually take pictures of the tchotchke on my cell phone, then remove it all to a different room, take all my pictures with the setting as clean as possible and then use my camera as or my my cell phone as a reference say, okay this can candy jar goes here this decorative towel goes there and replace it all at the end of my photo shoot so I told you the basic equipment there's one more very important piece of equipment Ugh! an excellent tripod now I cannot tell you if you are like all of us you have made the mistake or you will make this mistake of buying a Walmart or cheapo tripod it is not worth it. Now this is a behemoth. This is a giant tripod, but it is and it's a pain to carry, but it is so awesome because it's so sturdy and it supports my camera so well. And this cry tripod has has on it a separate thing called a ball head. And so this ball head, I can move the camera in any axis and get a perfectly level. Now you want, when you take your pictures, if at all possible, you use a tripod. And if at all possible, you want to be between four and a half and five feet above the ground. I mean, that's about right here. So I can just use my body as a, as a yardstick. And you're going to level your camera perfectly, either using a built-in level if it's in the camera or one of these gadgets or the little level on the tripod. And the reason that you want to do that is because at wide exposures, you get distortion. So if the camera is about four and a half to five feet above the ground, and if it's perfectly level, you're gonna get the least amount of distortion. You're still gonna get distortion, but you'll get the least amount of distortion, which, and it's just going to correct better in software. And yes, you're gonna to have to use software. What about light? I find that when possible, I use 
natural light, but in situations where I can't, I try to bounce a flash off the ceiling or in some other, use some sort of light modifier. Again, any flash will work just fine. This is a very old first generation Canon 430EX. They're now on the third generation. I think this was a little bit over $100 on some, I think Amazon on a used site and works just fine. So that doesn't have to be very expensive either. So, so I'll go in a room, make sure that everything is clean. I set up my tripod at the right length. Uh, I make sure that everything is perfectly level and then I'll either use the zoom in and out or I'll rotate the camera a little bit, get a lot of different angles, and I'm going to take them in the three, at least three exposures, overexposed, correct exposed, and underexposed. And in most cases, for me, I'm going to use the built-in HDR feature in the camera. Now, people will tell you that it is not as good as if you do it in software. That's true, but it's good enough and it looks awesome. So on the, it's different on every camera, but on this camera, um, you just kind of, press a button and you get this little selection and you pick pick HDR and you know it's very very simple and I, when I press the button it's going to take three shots overexposed correct exposure underexposed and then I'm going to actually have the camera then push them together so I have an even exposed picture and that means for instance if I'm in a kitchen the kitchen will be the right exposure but you'll also be able to look out the window and see the green grass and the rolling hills or whatever it's not going to be uh, where it's all just a white blur because the difference in exposure is so great between the inside and the outside. Of course, there are times when you can't do that. I'm going to show you one just a little bit in some software. But like if I'm in a bathroom or something, I'm going to have to just do the best I can. Um, so you do take it off the tripod on occasion. But when possible, use a tripod. When possible, try to use natural lighting. It looks better. When you can't, you do what you got to do. Can't hold your camera. Uh, use a flash. Do, do whatever is necessary. The quick correction. So just so it's clear, sometimes I say things and I assume and that's not a good thing to do. When you're taking flash pictures, you're not doing that in multiple exposures. When you're taking a flash picture, you're doing just the normal exposure with the flash. And if the exposure doesn't look quite right, then either adjust the flash compensation or so. But that's a single shot. When I'm talking about this HDR, I'm really talking about doing natural lighting because your flash really can't, most flashes can't cycle so quickly and adjust so quickly. So that's, so HDR is natural lighting. If you're in a closet or a bathroom or a basement or something, you do the best you can with just the flash in a single shot. Okay, back to the other part of my video. Now people say, should I shoot in RAW or JPEG? Obviously, RAW, which is like a bag of data, will give you the most data and it will allow you to do the most correction. I don't use RAW, even though it's the best thing to do, because JPEGs are so much more efficient. For instance, when I do this in-camera HDR, that's done in JPEG. It's so much better for me. The results are great as far as I'm concerned, as far as my customer's concerned. So hey, if he's happy and if I'm happy, all is good. So I tend to use JPEGs. Um, almost exclusively unless there's no choice. But I will try to do things like do a custom white balance um, and do other things to make sure that I'm not only properly exposed, but I have the right white balance. And um, so I have good material to work with when I do take it in the photo editor. The exception of that is something you're going to see in this photo editor, where I had to run into a house that was condemned. The house had caught on fire. My contractor friend had stripped the everything except the bare walls. He was starting to put new walls in, and I had to get in there and literally in five minutes or less take multiple pictures of multiple rooms and then take that home um, and then try to f make the best I could out of this this situation. So that was handheld quickly using a flash, whoops, using a flash, doing everything that I had to do to make sure that I was in and out quickly. So let's go to that now and I'm gonna show you the importance of software and why you really need to edit your pictures in some sort of software after you are done taking them. Okay, well here I am in a piece of software called DxO Photo Lab and this is software that I use instead of a program like Adobe Lightroom. I don't like Adobe products that much now that they've gone subscription. So here is a picture. It's an architectural picture. It's the inside of a building, the house that caught on fire, and I'm going to then follow the construction steps as my contractor friend reconstructs this house. Now you can see by this picture that I didn't follow all of my rules. The Certainly the picture is crooked, it's taken at the wrong sort of tilt and everything, but I had to really run in this house handheld and take a bunch of pictures very quickly just because the house is basically condemned. So are these pictures salvageable? Well, sure they are. Um, and we're going to show you how to do that in a quick and efficient way. So I'm on this one picture now, you can see it's all tilty and, and perspective is off over here and everything. And so 
in this software, I've purchased an additional piece of software called DxO Viewpoint, which is a perspective correcting tool. It's going to correct the perspective distortion. And you could do it in a lot of fancy ways, but I'm just going to use this little automatic button. And boom, our, our perspective is corrected. Now we're going to go with our white balance tool. And again, I didn't have time to do a custom white balance. I'm just going to pick something gray, because that's the way I am and it gets a little darker and richer and I like the, that white balance quite a bit there again there's really no point of comparison so I can really pick anything I want and I like that and then going to adjust the micro contrast a little bit to make it a little bit sharper I'm going to adjust the vibrancy a little bit because I just like vibrant things and I'm going to adjust the the exposure a little bit too. So I'm pretty happy with that the way that this particular shot looks but the cool thing about this particular software is I could then copy those presets so I'm gonna go copy correction settings and then now I can pick as many pictures as I want I'm gonna pick just these two together and I'm gonna apply those correction settings to those two photos this could be 10 photos or 20 photos if I wanted but I'm going to paste these correction settings there and all of a sudden boom that picture is corrected and boom that picture is corrected. So now in a matter of seconds, I have corrected these three pictures and I could have corrected 10. Now I can go back here and say, for instance, um, oh, was there something I would correct in here? Not really, I kind of think they look just fine, but I could go back and make other micro adjustments on the individual pictures if I wanted to too. But the whole idea here is really making your workflow as efficient as possible because then your customer is getting the work that they want and they're getting, the, obviously you're looking good at what you're doing, but you're also able to offer them the work at a reasonable price because of course you are efficient in your workflow. Okay, so that's the software example. So now you have a lot of tools, a lot of information to take really great architectural photos, especially of interiors. And and use that information if and see it's it's stuff that I've had to kind of learn by the the hard road, but it actually it actually has served me very well and I can very efficiently go in and take these photos now. Um, and you know, the more you take, uh, it's it's just it's just good business. If you get some time, um, I would really appreciate it if you look at some of my other media things. Uh, I have a podcast on uh, psychology and psychiatry and raising kids and everything that you could imagine called uh, Psychiatric Secrets Revealed. You can find that on iTunes and other podcatching sites. It's myself. I'm an MD. I'm a board certified psychiatrist. My wife is a PhD. She's a clinical psychologist. And we talked together. And I think this last one was on autism. It's actually a really interesting talk. She went and went to this conference. So it's like the cutting edge on autism um, for at least 2018. I also have a personal writing blog called drmikekuna.com, D-R-M-I-K-E-K-U-N-A.com. And this was an experiment that started out for just allowing me to write freely and personally and about my feelings and about retiring and I'm kind of semi-retired now and all that sort of stuff. And I'm branching this off into what could be a book project. I'm trying to interview just normal people. They have stories to tell. We all have stories to tell. And if you have an interest in this, please look at that blog um, and it, contact me. My contact information is on my website uh, and uh, you might be in my book if this turns into a book. And if you like this video, please, please, please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe. I am so close to getting 4,000 subscribers. You have no idea how long I've been working on this. I do not get promoted by YouTube since I don't do advertising. So I'm really buried in the feed someplace. It's amazing that anyone even finds me. Um, I'm not, you know, moving, uh, cozying up to camera manufacturers and they're not flying me all over the place. So I have great stuff to, 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 to places to go and things to see. So I would really appreciate it. I want to get over 4,000. And of course, I like to get further than that. But that would be so awesome if I could do that. And you could help me if you think this channel is worthy. Anyway, bye-bye.